HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Garden Cult, garden design and coaching. For a 15% discount on virtual garden consultations and coaching sessions, use code HRN15. Learn more at GardenCult.com. Hello, this is Lisa Held, and you're listening to The Farm Report a Heritage Radio Network show about the people, processes, and policies that shape how food is produced today. On today's show, we're going to zoom out and talk about issues facing the global food system. I generally tend to focus on the U.S. because that's where I am and what I know. But the truth is, if we're not talking about local and regional food systems, we're almost always talking about global food anyway since so much of the food produced in the U.S. is shipped abroad, and so much of the food we eat here comes from far-flung places. Plus, issues like the climate crisis and ending hunger transcend borders. That's one reason on September 23rd, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is hosting the U.N. Food Systems Summit with a goal of, quote, setting the stage for global food systems transformation to achieve the sustainable... (laughs) to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. My guest knows a lot about the upcoming summit and how it relates to the biggest issues facing the global food system right now. Ruth Richardson is the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. And we're going to talk about the significance of the summit and some of the controversies around what food systems transformation should look like and who gets to drive that transformation. Ruth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm so glad you invited me and very pleased to be joining you today. Excellent. And you are on the show from Toronto, is that right? I am based in Toronto, Canada. That's right. Great. So not only are we going to talk about global food issues, but this is actually a global episode. (laughs) Excellent. Fantastic. (laughs) So before we get into the um, crux of the discussion, I was reading your bio before, and I think it said that you're a farmer. Is that true? I'm from a farm family. My grandparents were farmers, and I spent a lot of time on that farm. And for a while, yes, my husband and I owned a farm outside of Toronto, and I grew a lot of garlic, which I loved. Uh, we don't own that farm anymore, but um, I still have the soil under my fingernails. <laughs> That's amazing. And garlic is like, it's hard to get good garlic. And that's, that's an incredible thing to, to focus in on. Um, so for people who don't know, what is the Global Alliance for the Future of Food? The Global Alliance for the Future of Food is a philanthropic alliance of 31 foundations that all fund food systems in some way. They're very diverse. They have very different entry points. Some consider themselves more climate change funders. Some fund more kind of biodiversity and conservation. Some fund farmers' rights and protections. Some fund public health. But what pulls them together and holds them in the Global Alliance is recognizing that food systems are so connected to all of these issues. Interesting. 
it's there there's so many organizations that work in kind of ways that I never think about, you know, <laughs> it's like an organization, four organizations, alliances, and there, there's a lot going on um, out there when it comes to the food system. So in another organization that, that we're going to be talking about is the UN and um, FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization. I think a lot of listeners on this show might not be that familiar with global governance and and that kind of whole world. Um, I would love to hear from you just, you know, especially because you're working in this space, how much do you think the UN and FAO, their, how much does their work impact agriculture and food systems in countries around the world? Yeah, I think the FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, you know, it has been instrumental in redefining sustainable food systems in recent years. Um, Hmm. They've published a report on world hunger, which confirmed that tens of millions of people have joined the ranks of the chronically undernourished, um, while a colossal like 2.3 billion people or 30 percent of the world's population um, lacks year round access to adequate food in 2020 alone. Um, you know, they're sending very clear and uncompromising messages that the rising rates of hunger are pushing us off course. Um, it's in this context that I think the FAO is so critical. It's a central stage to elevate these issues. Um, it's also a meeting place for global dialogue and debate. It's one of the few global spaces we have. Um, and I think for that reason, it's really important that we have that venue for countries to come together and discuss and determine you know, how we set the stage for global food production. Um, I'll just add, sorry, that um, the Global Alliance, um, we work a lot on agroecology or what a lot in the U.S. call regenerative agriculture. And I'm really, really pleased that the FAO um, has shown increasing support for agroecology and regenerative agricultural practices. So again, it's just playing a role, leadership role on a global level to elevate some of these solutions and um, help provide direction, policy, and resources. Okay. And the summit itself, the Food System Summit, is this the first time the UN is doing this? It is the first um, Food System Summit. Yes, they've had summits for climate and summits for biodiversity um, and other things, but this is the first UN Food System Summit. Okay. And it, so that's in service of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are also referred to as SDGs, because in all government, whether it's our government here in the U.S., our global governance, everything has an acronym. Um, <laughs> so the SDGs, um, can you talk a little bit, little bit about what those are and, and why they matter in the context of the food system? Absolutely. So the SDGs, in short, are a set of 17 interlinked global goals that were approved by nations around the world in 2015. And they formally recognize universal priorities for an equitable, sustainable, and healthy future. So they're designed to be, and I quote, a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. They also come with commitments from nation states to act on them. So they include things like goal two, which is zero hunger, goal five, gender equality, goal six, clean water and sanitation, goal 13, climate action, goal 16, peace and justice, um, and strong institutions. So I think they matter greatly if we are to address as a global community the major crises that we're facing, like climate change, drought, food security, COVID, biodiversity loss. Um, I think what people aren't talking about enough is the fact, from our perspective, that food systems are kind of the golden thread through so many of these, even just the ones I mentioned. You can see the food systems linkages. Mm. Um, So we think there's a huge opportunity to make those connections. Yeah, I was going to say that because technically the sustainable development goals apply to all sectors, right? Like it's it's not, they're not just for food, but the food system is unique in this way that it it touches so many of them right so it like it almost seems like the food system is a stronger lever for acting on all you know multiple goals at once as opposed to you know some sort of solution in energy that might only hit 
you know, the climate sustainable development goal. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. And um, one thing that we try to do at the Global Alliance is always think in systems. We're always trying to keep Mm -hmm. a systems perspective. And so, for instance, um, goal one is no poverty. Well, if you look at the number of people that are employed in food systems around the world as smallholder farmers, as farm workers, um, as service food service providers, you know, that that goal of poverty and livelihoods is so connected to food systems. If you look at um, life below the water, goal 14, we're talking about fisheries, we're talking about fish stocks, we're talking about seaweed. I mean, it's so connected to food. Um, If you look at sustainable cities and communities, goal 11, um, you know, think about all the um, opportunity within cities, both as consumers, the citizens of cities as consumers, but then also the opportunity for, you know, green roofs and urban agriculture and the list goes on and on and on. So not only are each of them, I think, very connected to food systems, but then you see the intersections and the interconnections between them. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like, you know, from your perspective, this is a really um important summit. The the FAO is doing some important work in terms of global food systems, but there are also a lot of controversies that are kind of swirling around this summit and many different groups have announced boycotts. Um, First of all, is the Global Alliance for the Future of Food boycotting or are you attending? Um, We are engaged in the summit. Um, I was given a mandate by my members in January of 2019 Um, I'm the chair of the Champions Network, which is one of the main structures of the summit. And through that, I also have a role on the advisory committee. Um, So my mandate from my members includes a number of important stances, if you want to call them that. Um, In particular, um, what we are trying to bring forward through the summit um, are three main priorities. One is a call for inclusive participatory governance Um, Secondly, we're calling for um, the mainstreaming of tools like true cost accounting. Um, In fact, we just recently published a sign-on letter, which all your callers can sign on to if they'd like to, calling for commitment Mm. on true cost uh, cost accounting. Um, And thirdly, um, we're calling for more action on agroecology and regenerative approaches. Um, And in fact, we also just formally signed on to the agroecology coalition that came about through the summit so, you know, in many ways, the summit has um, uh, had some controversies, but um, we also feel that it's been really important in catalyzing conversations about the future of food. In fact, at a scale that I haven't seen in the 10 years I've worked at the Global Alliance. So th- that's where we see hope. And, um, and, you know, we're moving forward with our mandate and the issues that we care about. Sure. And I, I mean, there's sort of two ways to look at it, right? I think the the issues you mentioned are kind of tied to some of the reasons people are boycotting it because they didn't think it's inclusive mm-hmm. enough, right? Or that agroecology wasn't given um, enough of a platform. And but by boycotting it, you can call attention to that issue. But, uh, you know, but at this on the other side, if you're there and those are the the things that you're pushing forward, um, you can potentially be pushing for those goals um, from inside. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think what has, um, you know, kept me motivated are the, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people that are inside the summit pushing for change. Um, And, you know, to be able to, to work with those people to, um, you know, sort of um, be able to advance agendas with those people to learn from them to debate the issues. I think that's, uh, you know, a critical role of the summit. Right. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Garden Cult, garden design and coaching. Carmen DeVito is a professional garden designer, certified New York State landscape professional, and the founder of Garden Cult. You may also know her from HRN's home gardening videos and our series, We Dig Plants. Garden Cult is a culmination of Carmen's more than two decades of experience designing and building gardens in New York City. Carmen believes that gardens and outdoor spaces should be healthy, environmentally sustainable places that enhance the health of people, nature, and the planet. She knows how to help you maximize the space you've got, help you work with and make the most of the materials, plants, and trees that you already have, and create an outdoor place to use and enjoy for you and your family. Get started at GardenCult.com. 
For a 15% discount on virtual garden consultations and coaching sessions, use code HRN15 through September 30th, 2021. That's code HRN15 at gardencult.com. All right, we're back. This is Lisa Held. You're listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. I'm talking with Ruth Richardson, the executive director of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. So Ruth, we've been talking about the UN Food System Summit that is happening on September 23rd. Um, And you mentioned you have these three goals that you're going to be pushing for at the summit. Um, Let's talk a little bit about agroecology first. So you mentioned that it's kind of like regenerative agriculture. That's what people call it in the U.S., right? Um, I'd love to get into that a little bit. So I've covered agroecology a little bit for civil eats. Um, and, you know, it's it's my understanding that the, the difference is that agroecology is sort of coming from this place that starts with um, – changing the balance of power in agriculture and kind of, um, you know, respecting indigenous knowledge and um, empowering um, smallholder farmers and kind of starting from there and then layering on this sort of ecological approach to farming that goes against the current kind of industrial standard. Um, Whereas regenerative feels like kind of the opposite. We're saying we want to be more sustainable, but there isn't necessarily a component that starts with um, any discussion of power or um, resources in agriculture. Is that like, how how do you think about it? Is that, is that similar to to how you would explain it? I'd love to kind of discuss yeah, we've had a lot of debates about this um, at the Global <laughs> Alliance, at the UN Food System Summit, in so many different circles. Um, so I'm glad you asked the question, Lisa. Um, first of all, I'll just say I'm not a, a hugely dogmatic person, so I don't tend to gravitate towards strict definitions of things. Mm. Um, and I think actually what is way more useful is to have a principles-based approach. What are the mm. principles that guide any of these approaches? And I think if we actually focused on the principles we would find more commonality than less. And so whether you're talking about indigenous foodways, which are really the bedrock, the basis of any of these approaches, or you're talking about agroecology, or you're talking about regenerative agriculture, or even organic agriculture, these approaches have so many similarities um, at the heart of them. I think part of the the difference is um, political I think that agroecology is a bad word in your country in many ways from a political perspective. It's, you know, in my country as well. Um, Hmm. In fact, I think our two countries, um, you know, were very much resistant to the FAO adopting agroecology as a formal stream. So you've got a whole political um, level of um, contentious (laughs) debate around this. Um, you know, and then there are people on the ground who are actually practicing these approaches and, and feel fairly strongly about them. So there's a there's a practical sure. perspective. But, you know, again, essentially, if you're looking at it from a principles perspective, I think there's so many things that bring these approaches together. So, you know, I we like to see it in a more holistic way. We like to try to find a common framework that holds all of it um, underneath that umbrella. Um, and we like to focus on the commonalities as opposed to the differences. Um, in terms of things like, um, you know, building soil carbon, things like, um, you know, reduction of inputs, um, like fertilizers and pesticides, uh, things like the use of natural, um, you know, inputs, uh, manure and urine and all those good things. Um, And yes, then there's the other, you know, pieces around a strong role for local institutions and communities. Um, you know, expansion of rights. This is where they start to maybe have some more differences. But um, my sense is that those that try to practice more ecological and regenerative approaches um, tend to, at the heart of their um, views, carry a lot of, you know, the the same objectives and intentions. Right. But yeah, I, I think one, one of the the sort of alternate perspectives is that by kind of broadening this this um, approach to agroecology, 
it's kind of opening it up to being co-opted by um, big producers who aren't really doing much to change the way food is produced, but just want to kind of take some of these principles and say, look, we're, we're producing food in a slightly more sustainable way. You know, maybe it's um, industrial systems that are planting cover crops or which have real benefits. Right. And so um, there's this kind of tension between, um, is it good? Is it good when these kind of like systems that were built by um, small farmers are then taken and disseminated in these ways that change bigger systems, but don't fully trans transform them, you know? Yeah. And all I can say, Lisa, is, you know, that's the history of the world. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't have an answer other than to say... Could you just answer all of life's big <laughs> questions for me, please? <laughs> um, you know, I think these are real concerns and real debates. And, you know, I, I, I just fall back to the need for principles that are our North Star that say, where are we trying to go? And how do we hold up the principles of resilience, of equity, of diversity, of um, renewability, you know, these really fundamental principles. And, you know, part of this is then how do we hold ourselves and each other to account in actually following those principles? So if there is a situation where agriculture, for instance, gets co-opted, how do we hold people account to that? And I think that's, mm. that's an important part of this picture. Um, again, I don't have the exact answer, but I do know that that's, you know, that's something that we need to stay really attentive to because it's important. And if, if the principles are compromised, that needs to be called out, right? And made visible. Absolutely. So based on those principles um, that you're referring back to, what are some of the biggest changes that you think would be really powerful that could just be made, you know, at a practical level on the ground to shift global food systems in a more sustainable, equitable direction? So um, maybe here I'll just talk a little bit about um, seven calls to action that um, we have developed at the Global Alliance. Um, I've been with the Global Alliance since its inception. And um, over those years, we have done an enormous amount of research, an enormous amount of convening diverse actors from indigenous leaders to private sector leaders to smallholder farmers and policymakers. Um, and it occurred to me um, about a year and a half ago that, you know, through all this research and the convenings and the conclusions coming out of those, we keep saying the same things over and over and over again. And so we actually dug into everything we've done for the last eight years and said, what are the main things that are the imperatives for food systems transformation? What has to happen to your question? Mm. And so out of that work in collaboration with so many others, um, we came up with these seven calls to action. So I won't list them. You can find them on our website and your listeners can find them on our website. Um, but for instance, you know, there's a call to action around governance. How do we actually govern food systems is a really important question, right? Who is at the table? Who has a voice? Who's listened to? Um, you know, that sort of set of questions. There's another call to action around public research for public good. You know, who's controlling the research agenda? Um, what does that research look like? To what end? Part of this, which is a really important question um, related to the summit and just generally speaking, is um, evidence. What evidence counts and for who? What evidence are we looking at? Are we just looking at Western Northern scientific evidence? Are we looking at indigenous knowledge and farmer knowledge as a source of equally important evidence or not? Um, so there's another sort of call to action. I think you know, your question you're talking about on the ground. So, you know, part of that is um, uh, our call to action around agroecology and regenerative approaches. How do we create enabling environments for these approaches to flourish? And so that, you know, um, calls into play investments, the money that's flowing to these approaches. It calls into play infrastructure. Do we have the roads? Do we have the processing plants? Do we have the facilities? Um, so that's a really important call to action of ours. Um, another one is true cost accounting, um, which is a really dynamic and open, comprehensive kind of framework to look at all the externalities and impacts of our food systems, whether we're talking about a certain product, whether we're talking about a certain production system, um, you know, what have you. It allows us to not just see, you know, sort of the specific price of something, price of a hamburger, it helps us see the costs and the impacts um, that are usually invisible, like 
pollution to waterways, like greenhouse gas emissions, like the cost of obesity and diabetes in hospitals. Um, this sounds maybe not quite on the ground and kind of um, a bit intellectual, but it can be applied very powerfully on the ground um, by farmers, by policymakers, by companies. Um, and it, it's a tool to aid in decision making so that people can make different and better decisions based on seeing the whole picture and not just part of the picture. So there's just a few examples of, of some of the things that we really feel are critical to shift systems. Yeah. One thing that's that's difficult for me in, in conversations like this is kind of wrapping my head around how things look so different from country to country in one place versus another. You know, like I'm so used to reporting on the U.S. where over the course of 10 years, I've been able to kind of understand what our systems look like and and have that context. And, and then, but even within the U.S., you know, the farming in Northern California looks completely different compared to what it looks like in Florida or the North, the Northeast, you know, and um, obviously what it looks like in, you know, on other continents is so different. And so how do you take into account those differences in economies and ecology and climate and all of that when you're trying to think about change it within this global framework? Yeah, it's incredibly important because it is all so context um, specific and we really need to acknowledge that and recognize it. Um, I think, you know, one of the things um, is finding these broader frameworks that are applicable in, in many different places, in fact, in every place. So again, if you look at true cost accounting, that is a framework that is applicable everywhere. And um, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, way back when, there was a conference in the U.S. called the True Cost of American Food. And wow. as part of that conference, we looked at three different farm systems in the U.S. and did a quick and dirty true cost accounting study. There was a dairy co-op in California. There was a um, conventional corn soy grower in the Mississippi Valley. And there was a... a deeply ecological farmer in the Northeast. And we looked at the negative and the positive impacts of those three farming systems. And we presented them on the stage with the farmers present um, to show them what these systems look like. And um, so there was an application across different kinds of systems. And in fact, it was fantastic and fascinating to see each of the farmers reactions um, which was essentially, number one, I didn't really know the impacts of my farm adequately. Mm. Number two, I don't want to farm with negative impacts. Like, that's not good, right? I've got grandchildren. Sure. <laughs> number, yeah. number three, it's hard to make changes because I'm locked into a political system and a farm bill. And so number four, I'm going to need to become an advocate. I mean, that was an amazing journey, right? With this true cost mm. accounting tool to see those sorts of changes. Um, we've also done true cost accounting in India. There's an incredible um, initiative called Community-Based Natural Farming in Andhra Pradesh, which is a state in Southeast India. Same framework applied in a very different context to say, how does community-based natural farming, um, how does that show us what the impacts are, again, negative and positive of that system? And therefore, what does it mean for the farmers themselves, for the policymakers in India, um, and for consumers who are purchasing those products. Um, we have an initiative called Beacons of Hope, which is looking at positive examples of food system transformation all around the world. We just apply true cost accounting to all those beacons of hope to say, what does true cost accounting tell us about the positive impacts of you know, all these different examples, whether it's a very large scale organic producer in Europe or a smallholder farmer in Mali? Um, so I think that's one way that we've thought about it, working at the global level, um, yeah. trying to establish these sort of overarching frameworks, but that can be applied in very specific context-based um, ways. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I, I love, there were great examples of that in, in the book that just came out, True Cost Accounting for Food, which um, I wrote about for Civil Eats, and I interviewed Lauren Baker, who works with mm -hmm. you at the Global Alliance. And there was a there was a really specific example that stood out to me, which was um, almond farmers in California who were talking about planting cover crops. And one of the farmers brought up that they didn't want to plant the cover crop because they were going through this terrible drought and they would have to water it. 
And that just blew my mind a little bit because as somebody who lives in an area that is extremely wet and, you know, in the Northeast, we always have water and often too much water. Um, I've been covering cover crops, writing about the ben- the incredible benefits of cover crops forever. And they're always presented as this, you know, solution that has every kind of benefit. And But I had never thought about the context of, oh, wait, what if you plant it in a really dry area and then it needs water? And like, so then you have to think about, is there a trade-off? And, and it just like that for me just clicked that clicked in my brain like oh yeah that when you apply this in each setting then you can really get at like how how can we build systems that work in this place but we're still using the same framework to evaluate them yeah yeah exactly yeah um so ruth um before we uh close this out um let's go back to the summit just for a second um what do you hope comes out of the UN Food Systems Summit? Like what would success look like to you going forward? That's a good question. Um, I think that for me, (laughs) um, you know, a couple of things. One is um, a multiplicity of solutions. There was a moment at the pre-summit when it looked like there was gonna be kind of a narrowing of solutions that would be highlighted. Um, and I'm really pleased that um, the summit is heading in a different direction, which is to broaden out the list of solutions. We know that there is no silver bullet solution. We know that food systems transformation is going to require, you know, many, many, many different approaches and different initiatives, different scales, etc. Um, and so I'm really happy that there's now a broader framework of five themes with lots of different um, solutions underneath that. So to me, that's that's sort of one bit of success. Um, second thing is um, the inclusion of some of the things I mentioned earlier. So um, for success, I'm looking at the inclusion of agroecology and regenerative practices being highlighted. I'm looking at the inclusion of true cost accounting. I'm looking at the inclusion of indigenous people's food systems, um, the importance of governance as an overall umbrella of how we make decisions and for who. Um, and you know, all of these are showing up, maybe not, you know, um, perfectly in our view, but they are showing up. And I think that's really positive. Um, the other thing I'm looking for is, um, sort of a balance between sort of the necessary and appropriate role of member states and government action and national pathways with the people of the people summit, (laughs) Um, So the other stakeholders and, you know, I really think the leadership is trying to find a balance between those two. Um, So those are those are a few things that we've been looking for. Looks like they're heading in the right direction. And so, um, you know, we we all just wait and see for Thursday's summit, um, you know, how this all plays out. A final thing I'll just say, which I think is critically important um, and it relates to at the Global Alliance, our theory of transformation, as we call it, we don't we don't abide by a theory of change, but a theory of transformation. And that is the relationships and networks. Regardless of what happens, there are hundreds and thousands of people that have engaged in the summit. And I have been able to develop really critical and important relationships in a matter of weeks and months that would have taken me years normally. Wow. And we believe that the way change happens is through these networks. It's through these connections. It's through these relationships. We know the summit is just one day. It's going to end. And then the hard work begins. And for us to advance that hard work, we need to be working in collaboration and in concert with others. And so the summit has been absolutely critical um, on that level. Um, You know, the people I've met and the alignment of agendas um, has been really inspiring and will be very important for us moving forward. Great. Well, Ruth, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of your insights. Thank you. So happy to be in conversation with you and um, and to share a little bit about the Global Alliance and our experience with the UN Food Systems Summit. Thank you all so much for listening to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it and share it. Until next time, this is Lisa Held. The Farm Report is powered by Simplecast.
Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Just enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.